Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we're taking a look at video number two from topic 3.6, Higher Order Derivatives. And the title of this video is Back to the Burge. And you'll see what I mean here as we move to the document. Uh, if you tuned it to video one, you saw a slight introduction to the notation of higher order, order derivatives and you know, a little discussion of why we studied them. And of course, a pretty simple example here in number one. But now we are going back to the Burge, as I said before. So back to the Burge is all about revisiting from the very first lesson that I had with AP Calculus about the ball that being uh, it's being dropped from the top of the Burj Khalifa. That's the tallest building in the world, which is in Dubai. It's 2,717 feet from the ground. And we are going to be able to look into this problem now just a little bit more uh, thoroughly because there are so many calculus tools that we know now that we didn't know on the very first day of school. And one of the things that I'm going to present to you is that the position equation that will depict the height, which is going to be called s of t in feet, that the ball is from the ground is modeled by this position equation. S of t is negative 16t squared minus 10t plus 2717. Now, I want to make sure that something's really clear as far as advanced placement calculus object motion is concerned. This is a problem where this falling object is affected by gravity those kinds of problems will not appear on the AP calculus exam. They're likely to appear on the physics AP exams, whether it's physics one, two, or even perhaps uh, physics C. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we do initially is to talk about those problems because they're a little bit easier to relate to. But by and large, we are not going to have to worry about memorizing these coefficients of acceleration uh, or half of acceleration and, and whatnot. They're going to be provided for you uh, for the purpose of our demonstration here today. We're going to look a little bit more closely at the actual object and particle motion problems a bit later on in unit four. So if we know that this S of T is, denote, is denoting the um, position of this object, I kind of want to put it to the test just to make sure. Uh, we don't have um, any question that specifically asks this, but let's say if I was to plug in zero for the position, just for kicks, if I let, uh, if I plug in zero for the time, I should say, what do I get for the position here? Well, these two uh, terms are going to just drop off completely because they have zeros for t and I get 2717 which makes a lot of sense because at time zero I have yet to drop this ball and therefore it should be 2717 feet from the ground because that's how tall the building is. As I let my t values be one or two or three it's very likely you're going to see that this number 2717 is going to be diminished because we're going to subtract some stuff from it until eventually that value could potentially be zero and thus we've hit the ground. Let's go ahead and take a look at example uh, two part A. Compute the velocity of the ball at time five. Now this is where we had a little discussion um, at the very beginning of the course that yes if we were to take a derivative if we had this power, we could freeze time. The only thing is, is we didn't know how to take a derivative on the first day of class. But now we can, and we know that the velocity is nothing more than the first derivative of the position. So in this particular case, we would get negative 32t minus 10, and then of course your plus 0, and that would take care of our derivative equation, and then to find the velocity at time 5, we need only to plug in the 5 for this t. And thus we have that. Okay, well let's go ahead and make that happen by moving over to our calculator. I know that we probably don't need a calculator to do this problem, uh, for part A at least, but it is calculator active and we can use it uh, throughout the question. There might be a problem or two uh, in this particular uh, example that we will require to use the calculator because it's going to be a little tough. So let's take a look at the calculator. So here we go, and we are supposed to... Uh compute negative 32 multiplied by 5 and then we subtract 10 
And of course, that answer is negative 170. So we'll return to the document. And within the document, we know that we can take that answer of negative 170 and we can place that as our answer for part A. We also want to put a label with that. And we have our measurements in feet and per second, feet and seconds. So we're going to take feet per second as our label. And the fact that this answer is negative makes perfect sense because this object is plummeting to the ground. It's falling, therefore the distance that the object is, the ball from the ground, is getting smaller, we're going to make that answer negative because it makes sense that if that uh, uh, rate of change is decreasing, then that distance is getting smaller. All right, for part B, it wants us to calculate the acceleration of the ball at time 5. So first of all, we have to know that the acceleration is simply the derivative of the velocity. Or we could think of it as the second derivative of position. Either way, you don't have to write all that notation out in this case. If we take the derivative of negative 32t minus 10, we of course get negative 32, a constant which means that if we find the acceleration at time 5, there's no t to change to a 5. So your value is going to be constant. We have a constant acceleration. That's because we're on planet Earth, and the acceleration constant is definitely negative 32 feet per second per second. You don't want to get this confused with, say, what you've maybe done in your physics classes and use that negative 9.8 because that's measured in meters per second per second. Now, this is definitely going to be um, uh, feet, as we said, and at the label is desperately in need of that per second squared, or you could say per second per second. So we didn't need a calculator there for part B. But I think that's about to change. Because when we get to part C, the question now asks when this ball will hit the ground. And quite honestly, that's not even a calculus question. This is a question that you could have encountered, let's say, in an algebra class uh, long ago that talked about quadratics and their application to objects being thrown into the air. But you have to think very logically. What happens when this ball hits the ground? What do you know? Where is it? Well, it's on the ground. Well, how high from the ground is it if it's on the ground? And that answer, of course, is zero. So all you do in this particular problem is you set s of t equal to zero. Now, you are not obligated to write out the s of t expression, uh, especially if you're about to use a calculator. But for the purpose of this video, I'll demonstrate what it is that you're really solving. And it's very likely that this has some ugly answers. It's possible that you could use the quadratic formula if this indeed doesn't factor, and I don't think it does. But since we have the functionality of a calculator, we're going to go ahead and use it. So let's go back to our calculator and solve this. Here we are once again with our TI Inspire. Uh, depending on the calculator that you're using at your particular school, there's a variety of ways to do this. You might have to graph your equation and set it equal to zero that way and find out where that graph hits the x-axis. But if you have CAS capability, you could go into, say, an algebra solve type of, uh, of, of algorithm, and we'll type in this expression, negative 16t squared, it was, uh, minus 10t and then plus that height of the building, 2717, uh, I believe is what it was. And we're going to set that equal to 0, but we have to tell the TI Inspire that we want to solve for t. And once we set that up, we're going to get a couple of answers. Wow, what a smart alecky calculator. It gives us these answers in an exact square root form, which we really don't want that. We have a hard time communicating that. I respect the fact that these are accurate answers, but I would rather get the approximation. So control enter will make that happen. I'll move my face out of the way. And you can see that there are two different times for which this equation will equal zero. One of them makes no sense at all. We're going to toss away the time that's negative because it is illogical when it comes to the falling object. But this one that's a positive, 12.722 or 12.723, if we want to round, is what we're going to use as our answer. So we're going to write that in our notes.
So we'll just say that t, the time, is approximately 12.72, and I'm going to go ahead and round that. And it's a good idea, once again, always put labels with your answers, and we are measuring this time in seconds. And then finally, we have one last question to answer, and that is, what will the velocity of the ball be at impact with the ground? So it's pretty clear that we're going to return to velocity. And if you haven't picked up on my color scheme, what I'm trying to do is use red for velocity, green for acceleration. I used purple for position down there. And so I want the velocity at a specific time. And that time would be 12.723. But to do one better than that, how about I go and use my four decimal place version of that that I had on my calculator, 12.7225. So that way it'll ensure a little bit more accuracy here. And this is going to give me what I want. If I just simply uh, evaluate this, I'm going to get negative 32 multiplied by 12.7225, and then I'll subtract the 10. And once I put this into the calculator, I'm going to have an answer. Let's return to the calculator one more time. And here we are. And as I said before, we're going to enter negative 32. And we're going to multiply that by our 12.7225. And then we subtract 10. And that will give us negative 417.12. It's always a good idea to double check and make sure there aren't any other additional decimal places. This one turns out that it doesn't. By just highlighting it and hitting enter, I can see that this terminated at the, at the hundredths unit of 2. So I have negative 417.12 that will return to our notes and write that down. So as we said, t is going to be, or I'm sorry, velocity at time 12.7225 is approximately negative 417.12. It is a velocity measurement, so that would be in feet per second. Now I want to clear up a common misconception about Part D. A lot of times students will say, well, what's the velocity at impact? And they think, well, wait a minute, when something is impacting the ground, doesn't it stop? And nothing could be further you know, from the truth there. That is not what's going on here. And the reason that is not true is because when vehicles collide or people jump off of high heights and fall to the ground, they sometimes get hurt. And it's because there's energy that's absorbed because of the rate at which people are moving. So the instant that this ball actually hits the ground after falling these 2,717 feet is going to be an actual velocity that we just saw, a pretty fast one, 417.12 feet per second in the downward direction. So make sure that you don't assume that you get a zero velocity, otherwise there would be no such thing as fender benders. People could skydive without parachutes if that was the case. So anyway, I hope this helps a little bit. It's your first introduction to uh, what we call sometimes kinematic motion. And we're gonna talk a lot more about this in some of the future units, but we wanted to, wanted just to give you a little bit of taste of it here in our topic 3.6. A couple other videos coming up, hope you can join us for those, and we'll see you next time.